thought Pastor was going to tell us he had things to say. No, oh, he's doing this he too. He said we so. still have four minutes. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> start early, some of my congregation might fall over in shock. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Not a, nobody fell over. Uh, my name's uh, Ken Loudenbeck. I'm the pastor here at Bridgeport United Methodist Church, and I want to thank everyone for coming tonight, and uh, we, uh, we've been so blessed. We're blessed with our... I met Paige a while back. And uh, I went to one of her events, and when I met her, and I was telling some of your biggest backers that are here tonight, I saw an authentic witness of Jesus Christ in someone who I, I want to affirm in the ministry. Uh, it was You're just genuine, and that's what we lack today. If we lack anything today is uh, we lack people that uh, have a genuine a genuine, authentic witness. Now, what I, when I say that, I'm not putting anybody down. What I mean by that is everybody's on a path and everybody's in their place. And I believe the ultimate truth will be one day, one day, we'll all get there. So everybody's in process. Everybody's in process. I mean, facts and truth are not the same thing. And what I mean by that, I was talking to somebody today and my grandkids today, and we were talking about the fact that there used to be nine planets in the solar system. Well, now the fact is there's eight planets in the solar system. It used to be a fact that the world was flat. Well, now it's a fact that the world is round. You know, all women love their babies. Well, it's a fact that there's some women that put their baby in trash cans. What I'm saying, when the Lord is here in finality, and when it all comes together as promised to us in Revelations, when that happens, the ultimate truth will change those facts into we will all love each other. And that day is coming. And in John 3.17, it says, God did not send his son to condemn the world, but he sent his son that the world, the whole world, might be saved through him. So that says we still have a chance Everybody's not condemned. In fact, everybody has a choice to make. So we're here today to celebrate our choice of being here, to celebrate authentic Christian witness, to, to worship and honor our Lord, and by doing that, by loving him and loving our neighbor. May I invite you to pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come here uh, praising you. We come here to worship you. We come here to hear about how you work in our lives. Lord, we ask you to, to just pour out your Holy Spirit upon all of us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive your good news. Your good news of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, that he, that he was born a real person. He did live in history. He was tried by Pontius Pilate. He was crucified. He was dead, he was buried, and on the third day he was resurrected. And the good news of all that is it goes the next step, the second commandment. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves, all of our neighbors, Lord. So, so thank you for that message. Thank you for showing us how and what to do. But most of all, Lord, we want to thank you for the relationship, the relationship with you and the relationship with each other. Lord, I ask you to... Uh, Bless this service tonight, in the holy name of Jesus Christ we pray, and the whole church said, amen. amen. I'm going to let you introduce yourselves, and I'm just going to turn it over. We call them milk and honey, okay? Hi, guys. My name's Ava, and this is my sister, Mia, and this is our friend, Jess. Um, so we just have a couple of songs for you guys tonight. Feel free. If you want to stand up, you can. If you want to sit and just enjoy, it's just up to you. Thank you. 
When night has fallen, when fear is calming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. Oh, echo in my soul. Soul. In every season, you keep repeating promises to me. Now there's no stopping what you have started till it is complete. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I've decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking down like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking down like an echo, an echo in my soul. No. 
putting up with us. Um, I will pass this on to the next person. I don't know if it's Pastor. What Pastor? I'm not the one. <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, we can. If everybody, uh, yeah. You're welcome. It's the wrong spot. Sorry, uh, Gus is going to get on piano. We'll just take a minute. So I want to introduce you to my granddad.
much for allowing us to come together today to worship and hear from our speaker soon. I pray that your presence just fill this place and that um, today just be a blessing to everyone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. bring the, uh, the matriarch of these two daughters up and she says the most beautiful prayers I asked her about three minutes ago if she would pray tonight I keep doing this to everybody and so beware you know be ready be ready that's the message we have to be ready okay so would you please thank you I'm not very brave and my accent is a little hard, but Ava is going to help me. I, I'm going to pray in Spanish, and she's going to translate for all of you. Thank you. Padre, gracias por esta tarde maravillosa. Lord, thank you for this wonderful evening. Gracias porque sabemos que estás aquí en medio de nosotros. Thank you because we know that you are here among us. Y que una vez más, Señor, and that once again, habitas en la alabanza de tu pueblo. You are here in the uh, praise of your people. Gracias, Padre, por cada persona reunida aquí. Thank you, God, for every single person here today. Nosotros sabemos que te complaces en la alabanza de tu pueblo. We know that you delight in the worship of your people. Y te complaces cuando tu pueblo se reúne en tu nombre. And you delight when people come together in your name. Y eso es lo que hacemos aquí esta tarde. And that's what we're doing here today. Bendice a cada uno de nosotros. Bless each and every one of us. Bendice a cada uno de nuestras familias. Bless our families. Bendice a cada uno de nuestros hijos. Bless our kids. En el nombre de Cristo Jesús. In the name of Jesus Christ. Y a tu familia repartida por toda la tierra. For our family throughout the world. Our en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Te alabamos. We worship you. Te damos honra. We give you honor. Y gloria. And glory. Gracias, Señor, por Thank una vez you. más estar con nosotros. For once again being with us. Amen, amen. Amen. Thank you. Two thousand years ago, approximately, Jesus Christ uh, lived out uh, the gospel message which God sent him us and for me and what I believe is the truth of the scripture it's all about relationship it's about relationship and um, 800 years or so before that there was a prophet named Isaiah and there's a Psalm 53 which I want to read it'll take me about two minutes to read it um, but if this wasn't or isn't about Jesus Christ, then you tell me who it's about. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. For our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before a shearer is silent, 
so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear the iniquities of Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That's Isaiah 43. That was 800 years before Christ was born. That was prophecy. And Christ fulfilled that prophecy. And we now are living in that prophecy. And now we have free will, which we have the responsibility that goes with it. And that is we have a choice to make. We either receive him as our Savior or we try to figure it out for ourselves. And I can tell you, me trying to figure it out for myself, for myself, it's not good. But when I allow the grace of God to come into my life, he surrounds me with the right people at the right time. It's not even about me. The next thing I know, I've been changed. I want to be, I'm not here for the blessing. I am here for the blessing, but I'm here to bless others. Now it's no longer, what am I going to get for this? It's, what can I do for others, the other believers? We become changed. Tonight's uh, speaker has the most interesting name of anybody I ever met. I like Tycho. I thought that was interesting. But, but when I heard the name Stingray Rob, I thought, wow. Uh, I'm going to let him explain all that. I am not that I know of a prophet because, because I know this much... Uh, when I say, say what time things are going to start, I'm never right. <laughs> but it always just seemed to be right on time when I turn it over to him. And I do believe this. I got to spend a lot of time with a, a Stingray, your father, Larry. And, oh, man, uh, it was, it was the, probably one of the best conversations I've had with a very proud father. But just like Paige, someone who has an authentic testimony of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So now I get to hear Stingray speak. So Stingray, I would like to invite you to come up, uh, take, as, take as much time as you'd like, and uh, we'll just, let's hear it for Stingray. Thank you. So I, I think we actually have a video to play first. So I'm going to let that give you a little background on who I am, and I'll give you a little story. So... I'm going to sit right here. (laughs) Throughout his motorsports career, Idaho native Stingray Robb has pushed limits, fought battles, and climbed his way to become the driver he is today. After a slow start to another Indy Pro season, Stingray found himself searching for answers following a disappointing result at Mid-Ohio. Race one, I think I started like second. I was so close to to getting that pole. And I ended up finishing that race in 10th. And it was no one's fault but my own. I came in after that event and I was just so disappointed with myself. I was like, I've given up. I ended up walking away from the team for a little bit. I was like out there just praying, hoping that I could find an answer of just like, how much more do I have to go through? And in that moment, I kind of felt like a peace and clarity in them just thinking back about everything that has happened was all for a reason. You know, from that moment on, I felt happy. I mean, I was ready to learn from those mistakes and 
the next day I ended up getting my first win. People think that the win was the turning point, but it was that 10th place finish that finally set the direction. That same ambition and drive to learn was what helped him clinch the Indy Pro 2000 Championship in 2020. A spark that would ignite his hunger to win a spot on the NTT IndyCar grid. His debut Indy Light season brought with it a learning curve, showing Stingray new speeds, and more importantly, new rivals. Once again, linking up with his championship winning team, Rob put his head down and piloted his Uncos racing machine through the rest of the year's events, capping off an experiential season that proved vital in his education as a racing driver. 2021 as a whole has been a little bit of a disappointing year for me. You know, we had uh, high expectations to, to compete at the front of the field and we just weren't able to achieve those. I can't tell you enough that I am motivated beyond compare compared to where I was last year. Going into next season, I know what we're capable of and I know that uh, where I'll be, it will be enough that I can have the resources to compete at a high level. All I can say is good things about Hunkos Racing. Um, they've been a huge part of my career the last three years. They're like my family. And so I, I'm sorry to them for the year that we had, but I think the focus is forward and on to next year. For 2022, the Indy Lights grid has grown hungrier. Champions will join other champions when the green flag drops in St. Petersburg. And this time, Stingray Rob has joined forces with a tight icons of the sport, legends of speed. Andretti Autosport has produced the last three Indy Lights champions, a pedigree which has single-handedly built the icons of tomorrow. As Stingray prepares for the biggest season of his career, he sets his eyes on one thing, adding his name to that list. So I always do the disclaimer before I start speaking that I'm a better race car driver than I am a speaker. So you're gonna have to bear with me through this. Um, but you can go to the next slide, actually. Um, you're probably all thinking that Singer's my fake name. How many of you think it's my fake name? Does anyone think it's my fake name? I see a couple Throughout hands, that's his it. Motorsports career. Well, Stingray is actually my real name. So short story is, my dad was a big Corvette fan. And so he decided to name me after the Stingray Corvette. Mm. Here I am, race car driver now, and it worked out well because being an accountant just doesn't really roll with the name Stingray. <laughs> so this is what I get to do. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about what I learned in my racing career about how having identity in Christ gives you purpose in life and kind of how it sets you free to perform. So next slide. So as you saw in that video, in 2020, I had one of the best years of my life. Despite there being a global crisis with COVID, I still got to enjoy my passion of racing. I ended up at the end of the 2020 season as the Indy Pro 2000 champion. And that picture there on that top left, that's me on the podium at the final race of the year as champion. This was a, thanks guys. This was a moment I had been waiting for for most of my life. I could remember since the time I was five that I knew I wanted to be a Formula Car champion. And that's actually me top right now, five years old in my first go-kart. So it's from that moment that I, I wanted to get to that spot where I was on the left. So having reached that dream in a small way, I felt accomplished, thankful, and incredibly honored to be surrounded by the people that helped me achieve such great success. Next slide. So having won that championship, I received a scholarship. And that scholarship moved me up to the next series of Indy Lights. So for those of you that don't know, there's a ladder to, to IndyCar. It's just like any other sport, baseball, basketball, football. You got single A, double A, triple A majors. So IndyCar being the major leagues. So I got to step up to that triple A ladder as a scholarship driver the next year. So this was only one step away from the ultimate goal of racing IndyCar. Indy Lights is a development series, as, as I said. So if you perform well there, then typically you can earn a ride to get into IndyCar the following season. So this is my plan, win Indy Lights, go to win IndyCar, and then win the Indy 500. That was it, plain and simple. It's gonna be year after year, and I would be there, easy, no big deal, right? <laughs> Happens all the time. So, um, and if God had gotten me that far, why would he not carry me the rest of the way? The rest of the, the, rest of the schedule that I had planned in my own mind. Next slide. Now that schedule I had in my own mind, I needed to test against what is said here in Proverbs 16.9. The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. 
kind of ironic, right? You can go to the next one. So my victories from the previous season began to be my identity. I'm a champion. I'm a race winner. I'm a great driver. The results say so. The next season, 2021, as a rookie in Indy Lights, being last year, I expected to dominate. Like I said, I wanted to win Indy Lights, go to IndyCar, and then win the Indy 500. I more than outdid myself by doing the exact opposite. I spent most of my time in the back half of the field driving around with second to last and last place drivers. The results were weak, and so began the downturn of my results-driven identity. I felt terrible, and I felt like I was a bad driver. The results defined who I was. You can't get it right. Last season, it was a fluke. You'll never be good enough. All of these thoughts became my internal identity. These thoughts were not good, life-bringing, or even God-reflecting. I needed to test my thoughts to this verse here. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and pretensions that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I needed to capture my thoughts that said that I had to have good results to have a good identity. I needed to test them against the word of truth. The lies that we believe are only as strong as the falsehoods that we believe, but the truth will set you free. Now, it's what's said in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28, and 30 that says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, when our identities are rooted in truth, we are set free to perform. We are set free to live and reflect the greatness of God. But that doesn't mean we won't have struggles because it's what's said in John 16, 33 that completely gives the other message to that. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When you find identity in Christ, it is no longer up to you or me, but the freedom to perform comes, or freedom to perform and succeed comes from his grace and forgiveness of the failures from our past. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it is what's said in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 that tells us how we are set free to perform. For it is by grace, by grace, not by your own doing, that you have been saved through faith. And that's a reference to John 3.16, which we'll get to later. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So all those things I was saying in my head that I was boasting about, my identity, about the results say I'm the best, that has no place here. <laughs> I got humbled pretty quick, to say the least. My, da- my stepdad always says that there's two kinds of men in the world, those that are humble or about to be. So I got, I got the better treatment of both of those. Next slide. When we believe in Christ, we are set free to perform, to overcome, to struggle, to struggle well, and to live for a purpose and have an unshakable identity because we are set in the book of life that lasts for eternity. Jesus changes everything. He changes our purpose, our goals, our beliefs, our convictions. We no longer are living for the things of this world. We are set free to live for the ultimate gift of God and eternal life. You being saved is not based on your performance, but you're free to perform because you are saved. Next slide. Did any of you guys watch the Super Bowl this last year? Yeah? So Cooper Cup, he was the MVP of the Super Bowl this last season, and this is what he had to say about winning. It was written already, and I just got to play free, knowing that I got to play from victory, not for victory. I got to play in a place where I was validated not from anything that happened on the field, but because of my worth in God and my Father. His identity was set. He didn't have to work for it. It was already written ahead of time. He knew that in the end, God wins. This is how we should live every day. This is an eternity mindset. Next slide. So I'm going to tell you guys three things that will lead to greater rewards and the biggest gift we could ever receive. Number one, recognize your need. Now, if you brought your Bible, this is a good time to open it to John 21. And I'm going to attempt to read and hold my notes all at the same time. Yeah, let's hope so. (laughs) Now, this is after uh, the crucifixion of Jesus and when Peter denied Jesus three times. And after he denied Jesus three times, he felt extreme guilt, shame, and lack of purpose in his life because he had betrayed the one thing that gave his life meaning. Fast forward to when Jesus reveals himself after his resurrection to the disciples while they were fishing. 
That's where we are in John 21. Now, just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? I love this. This is so funny to me. They've been fishing all day. They answered him, no. He to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have been fishing before, but typically the same fish that are on the left side are on the right side of the boat. I haven't been too lucky on switching sides and then catching a bunch of fish. So, so they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. I can just picture it. The guy's out in the boat, like in his boxers or whatever, just hauling in this big load of fish. He's like, that's Jesus. Puts his clothes on and just like dives in head first into the water. I think that's so amazing. So this is what's so cool. Peter recognized his need for a savior, and he rushed to shore after Jesus. He recognized his need for a purpose and redemption of his guilt. Now, number two, the point I'm going to make is receive his redemption. Now, verse 15 through 19, here's where I'm going to read. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, remember, this is the same guy that said he didn't even know Jesus when Jesus was dying on the cross in his worst time of need. Same man, Jesus asking this question. Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. That's so cool. He said to him second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. It's like, okay, seriously, I, I answered the first time. You think you'd hear me on the first time. He said to him, tend to my sheep. Verse 17. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was so grieved because he, was, he said to him the third time, do you love me? So Peter responded by saying, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted, but when you are old... You will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This is he, or this he said, to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Jesus is providing redemption to Peter in the moment to counter his betrayal of Jesus. And this is so cool about our faith, is it doesn't just provide a value to our lives when we die, it's not just for the future that we believe. It applies to our life now. And what is happening here is applying to Peter in that moment. Now that redemption came when he asked Peter to affirm his belief in Jesus by asking three questions. Do you love me? Do you love me? And do you love me? In verse 18, Jesus redefines our future. It's referenced in verse 18. He defines our future. He promises Peter another chance to face death, just like he did when he denied him, and a chance to glorify Jesus with his actions this time around. Now, it doesn't explicitly say in here, but Peter would go on to lead a movement. And because of his faith, he would die on a cross, but he did not consider himself worthy to die on a cross like Jesus did. So he was asked to be crucified upside down out of conviction for the love of his Savior. Now, number three, receive his purpose for your life. After your, each of Jesus' questions of affirmation, Peter responded with a resounding yes. You see, Peter recognized his need when he got out of the boat, and he confirmed his belief and love for Jesus when he answered yes. Both of these are very applicable to our life after death, but it is what he did next that gave him value in the moment. After each time Peter responded with the affirmations of love, Jesus called Peter to his purpose. This is so cool. Feed my lambs in verse 15. Tend to my sheep in verse 16. And feed my sheep in verse 17. And finally, the greatest call of all, verse 19, follow me. Now, point four, do the work. Peter continued in, the purpose, in his purpose by doing the work that Jesus called him to. 
He was one of the founders of our faith and shepherded the way. See what I did there? Shepherded, tend to my sheep. There you go. Huh? For so many Christians. What does this look like for us? Now, Proverbs 21.5 says this. Good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. There is no quick way to greatness. It's what we do consistently that others may only do every once in a while that sets us apart. So work hard and not for the approval of man, because that will never come. But as for the Lord, to seek and share his glory. Jesus tells us that his load is light, and this allows us to work hard without being slowed down with the troubles of this world. When we suffer, we suffer, suffer for something greater than ourselves. Now, I'm not much of a reader, but I set a goal to read 30 books this year. And part of that is to grow my faith. So next slide. This is from a book that I recently read by C.S. Lewis called The Weight of Glory. And I think it's so perfect the way that he says this here and how we are supposed to receive our purpose from God. It will come to us when we occupy those places in the structure of the eternal cosmos. He says this so eloquently. I'm like, this, I need simple man right here, but it's so good. <clears throat> we occupy those places in the structure of the eternal cosmos for which we were designed or invented. Then he goes on to say some more and then says, the value of the individual does not lie in him, so it doesn't lie in me. I am not where that purpose comes from. He is capable of receiving that value. He receives it by union of Christ. The place was there first. The man was created for it. So I think that's so cool. Last slide. So I'll leave you with one more verse, which is John 3.16. You guys probably all know it. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, if you haven't had a chance to live free, to perform for a purpose, I invite you to now. This is one of the biggest decisions that you'll make in your life. It'll set you free to perform away from the racetrack and on the racetrack. I've seen it in my own life. So um, Christ, he, he gives up, him, gives, or if you give up yourself for Christ, you will find a refreshment of grace in, in, this, in the source of life. So I'm just going to say a quick prayer. That's all I got for you guys. And uh, I will stay up here if you have questions. Yeah, we're going to have an application to come after the Okay. okay. Yeah, so I'll be out there after. Anyways, uh, dear Lord, thank you so much for this awesome group of people here today, and thank you so much for allowing us to share our message um, from you, Lord, and we know that this is all for your glory. So keep us um, in your presence. Help us to be salt and light to those among us as you already are, and help us to, to live on purpose for your purpose today. And we pray. Amen. Thank you for that, Stingray. Um, I know it was a very timely message for me. I'm sure, I hope it was a timely message for you guys too. I know there's um, so many different things that are fighting for um, our identities, whether it's what we own, how we look, what we do. Um, there are so many different things, but when we find our identity in Christ, then we can be truly free. And so to piggyback off a verse that he read, I would like to finish it. Um, so Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. So when we recognize that we are God's masterpiece, just as Peter did when Jesus reaffirmed him, um, in John 21, um, we can go and do the things that he planned for us long ago. So whether it's in your jobs, whether it's in your home, whether it's in your neighborhood or at the racetrack, you can go out and do those good things that he planned for you to do long ago for him. So I'd like to pray us out so that we can go and do those things. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for every single person that is here and for the message you gave us through Stingray and through the music today. Thank you for reminding us that you love us, that you made us for you, and that um, we can live for something so much greater because of what you've done for us through Jesus on the cross. And so I just pray that you will help us to live in that as we go out today and that you'll help us to see the opportunities that you've given us to do the good works that you've planned for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh.
Yes, thank you all for coming. And um, Did I just cut you off? No, it's okay. No, good. finish. My bad. <laughs> I forgot, and then I came <laughs> back. Um, <laughs> But thank you all for coming. Um, uh, my ministry exists to create moments for race fans to encounter Christ through relationships. So it's all about following Jesus um, and enjoying racing away from the racetrack. So if you guys are interested in um, a community of Christians who love racing, go out and uh, check out my invite cards to my Facebook group, Christian IndyCar Fan Community. Um, if you'd like to receive devotionals every single Monday that are based on a race from the weekend before, feel free to scan the QR code out there and um, sign up for the email list. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate you guys, and uh, have a good week.